from Yosemite National Park in front of Half Dome. Welcome to the GCN Show. Welcome to the GCN Show, brought to you by Wiggle. This week, are all the unwritten rules of cycling total crap? We have found six that might not be. We have news of the best cycling cities in the world, science to make you train better, and we have an update from our all-terrain hero, Mathieu van der Poel. This week in the world of cycling, we learned, or rather, Ollie, James and Alan learned, that the weather in the high mountains of Italy in May is not exactly reliable. No, this footage was shot just this last week and is from one of the big three mountain stages yet to come in the Giro. In fact, two of the passes are still closed now. Yeah, it's going to be touch and go where yeah. they're in the race, I think. And now we also learned this week that if you've ordered a pair of city cycling shoes in the USA, you might not receive them anytime soon because, wait for it, an F-16 fighter jet crashed into the warehouse in California. Now this does sound like the ultimate dog ate my homework excuse. It does, but then if you're gonna make an excuse, you might as well go big. Uh, true, the distributors have however said that it is completely true. Fortunately though, no one was injured, not even the pilot. Yeah, no word on the shoes themselves Ooh. though, so we'll keep our fingers crossed for them. Fingers crossed, indeed. Now, in the cycling world, there's been a lot of talk recently about the unofficial rules of cycling and about how they should be just ripped up and thrown in the bin because they put newcomers off for being elitist and snobbish. Phil Gaiman has thrown his hat into the ring by suggesting his own rules recently, and it's fair to say they make a lot of sense, but there's a part of me that feels a little bit sorry for those much maligned original unwritten rules that are actually written down on a website called voluminati.com if you want to check them out. And I think the reason I feel sorry for them is because I don't think they were ever intended to be serious. I think they're a bit of a piss take, but yet they're now kind of being held up as everything that is wrong with the sport of cycling. So in their defense, we've gone through the rules and chosen a few which we don't think are actually complete rubbish. But it has taken us a little while because there are now 102 of them. That's a lot of rules, isn't it? Yeah. That might be part of the downfall of the rules when there's 102. Yeah, it could be. Anyway, starting with number 13. If you're out riding in bad weather, you're a total badass. Yeah, it's hard to argue with that one, isn't it? I mean, we would all, I would imagine, of course, like to ride when the weather is nice. Yeah. But if you've got to go out when it's minging, it does leave you with that sense that, you know, yeah, like it's worthy what you're doing, isn't it? Yeah, if I was out in the hail or the wind and the rain, I felt like I was getting one over on the rest of the world because I was the only one out on my bike. Yeah. And also, it makes getting home a heck of a lot nicer. Oh yeah. Next, number 14, two good ones in a row. It never gets easier, you just go faster. Yeah, you see, that's a bit counterintuitive, isn't it? But it is true. I mean, it should get easier, but we cyclists are a strange bunch. Yeah. And actually, instead of letting it get easier, we do just push harder, therefore go faster and or further. Although, stranger still is that the fitter you get, the easier it is to push yourself harder. So maybe it's like a paradox. Yeah, bizarre, isn't it? Then we have number 23, and it's a bit of a contentious one, this. Always introduce yourself when joining another ride or group that you weren't invited to be a part of. Yeah, I think this is about how you read it, isn't it? Because it yeah. should be like, rather than always introduce yourself, it could be like, always introduce yourself. Because it does feel like cyclists should be open and inclusive, but that extends both to the group or the person joining as well, shouldn't it? Yeah. Just be friendly. Interpretation says a lot about these rules, actually. To me, it's just plain decency, introducing yourself on a ride. If you're gonna spend time with someone, then it's time riding alongside someone. You're gonna want to tell them who you are because otherwise it's just odd that you're a bit of a tagger on. Yeah. I, I just can't see a reason not to do that. Say hello. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's a good one. Uh, gonna stick with group riding actually. Two more, 93 and 95. So don't half wheel and don't surge. I was tempted to put 94 in as well, which is that group rides always leave on time without exception. However, without exception, I am always five minutes late to a ride, even when I'm going out by myself. So I didn't really feel like I was qualified to put that one in. Uh, but anyway, so don't half wheel and don't surge. If you're new to group riding, those terms probably won't mean all that much to you, but you very quickly learn that they're essential to a cohesive group that actually works seamlessly and as a unit, and you get that kind of well-oiled machine feeling. Speed for free, basically. That's what it feels exactly. like. Exactly. Yeah, here's the thing about rules in group riding. Some really help to make the ride more enjoyable and smoother, but I think the important thing is actually how they're communicated. Yes, that's very true, isn't it? You've got to be polite 
and be friendly. Yeah. But I'm inclusive. Yeah, I'm very thankful to the person that took me gently to one side on my first ever club run back in 1997 and explained to me what I was doing wrong. And I wish I could remember who that person was because they've had a remarkably big impact on the way my life has turned out. If they'd got a shouty at me, maybe I'd have thrown my toys out of the pram, gone home and, I don't know, taken up running or triathlon. Yeah, it's incredible actually. <laughs> Sorry, no, I can't even joke about that. No, I wouldn't have done, no way. <laughs> It's incredible how those early early experiences shape your life afterwards yeah. with cycling. Anyway, another rule that I find hard to argue with, number 35. Socks can be any colour that you damn well like. Yeah, that is hard to argue with that one, isn't it? Um, seriously though, we would be very, very interested to know what, what you all think about cycling's unwritten rules. Is it time that they were torn up and we just said, hey, let's not be elitist and snobbish, let's be open to everyone? Or actually, are some of them important for enjoyment of group rides and indeed safety? Make sure you let us know what you think in the comment section down below. Yeah, can I add to that, side? Yeah. I would like to know, do you ride in a group that has your own set of unwritten rules and what are they? Well, then they'd have to write them down. In the comments box below. But then it's not an unwritten rule. Oh, written unwritten rules. Ooh, it's gray area. Next up, it is our weekly inspiration. At that point in the show where we go through and pick out some of our favorite photos that you've been sending in that are really inspiring us to ride. The top three all get a voucher from our mates over at Wiggle. £50 for third, £75 for second, and a £100 voucher for first place. Who's rounding out our podium, Chris? Well, first up, we have Fungi over in South Africa on a solo training ride. Fungi. Fungi, I bet he is. Keep down this one, and look at those trees. Oh, wow. And the colour of the sun. I was going to say that. that it's the light in South Africa that people go nuts for, isn't it? And uh, you can see why in that photograph. Yeah. I also like how he's effectively taken a, a selfie, but you can't see that he's taking a photo in his shadow. Well practiced, I reckon. How have you done that? Oh, I like that very much. All uh, right, second place uh, sent in by Doug from Utah. This is from Richmond. He said, I never stop riding to shoot a picture. Amen there, Doug especially in the middle of a good climb, but the view was too spectacular to resist. And I've got to say, I sympathise. Yeah. It would be tempting to stop and probably worthwhile because you've now got 75 pounds worth of vouchers. So there we go. Not, not what I expected from Utah. No, I not at all. A lot greener than yeah, I was expecting. Yeah, absolutely. This week's winner though is Adrian with the Livervale disc in Brasov, Romania. Local climb in Romania after a night full of rain. This was an amazing threshold training ride. I've never heard a threshold training ride described as amazing. <laughs> no, Maybe I used to love UPV. those. Yeah, to be fair, that photo That's looks absolutely amazing. wicked, doesn't it? Yeah. Although, can I say, weird thing, I really hate riding on wet roads when it's sunny. Yes, I, I do same. agree with this completely because you're like, well, I shouldn't be getting dirty because it's not. It's yeah, not raining. It's, I'd rather it was still raining than yes. wet roads and sun. Then anyway. you're getting dirty for a reason. Yeah, there we go. I can't see that it's it's really wet on the road, no. uh, so hence why you're the winner because that is just a really it's just a cracking shot. Uh, if you want to take part in our weekly inspiration, super easy. Either use the hashtag GCN Inspiration on Instagram or use the uploader, the link to which in the description beneath this video. It's now time for Cycling Shorts. We'll start Cycling Shorts this week with news of the best cities in the world for cycling. This is a list compiled by insurance company Koya. It's not an exhaustive list, but they've clearly put a lot of thought into it. They have. Number one, perhaps unsurprisingly, is Utrecht in the Netherlands. Amsterdam, meanwhile, languishes down in fifth place. Between the two, you've got Munster in Germany, Antwerp in Belgium, and Copenhagen in Denmark. Sixth place is Malmo, Sweden, just ahead of Auckland, New Zealand, and Hangzhou, China. The first entry from the UK is down in 17th, and that's Bristol. Bristol! Right. Which comes in just ahead of um, Montreal in Canada, their first entry. The first entry from Australia is 21st, and that's Melbourne. And But the first entry from the USA is down in 39th, and that's San Francisco. Yeah, I would have thought that a lot of these positions would be up for some pretty hot debate. Certainly if you live in those cities, I've heard yeah. rumblings of discontent, people from Bristol saying that we should be further down. But like you, I think it's pretty well thought out. The index takes into account of uh, rider safety, bike safety, level of infrastructure, critical mass, even weather. Mm. Although again, residents of Bristol, like me, might take exception to the uh, fact that they reckon that Bristol weather's all right with 69. I don't think it is, but there you go. It's a good point, actually. Think of the Northern Hemisphere. Holland, I'm surprised they're in the top 10 at all. Uh, right, next up, 
We're in need of a P-band, ladies and gentlemen. Positive bicycle advocacy news on behalf of our brothers and sisters in New York who have long been using an abandoned military airfield in Brooklyn for weekly races. But it turns out that they're facing, get this, a 22,666% price rise for the privilege of using that ground. Absurd. Patch.com reports that the club that were promoting the event are now facing charges of $34,000. This is because the land is now managed by a private company. Yeah, Aviator um, Sports, yes. I believe. No longer the National Park Service. Yeah, so could well be worth an email to Aviator Definitely. Sports. And then we might get our P-Ban. Woo, woo, klaxon. I like the sound of that. Cycling Science over on Twitter has been posting some brilliant links of late, including this little nugget for anyone that's into their training. A meta-analysis published in the International Journal for Sport, uh, Sports Physio Physiology and Performance. Concluding, it's one of my favourites, Chris. Love that one. Yeah, it's not a bad one. Concluding that actually there is very, there's no evidence to show a benefit of training at low cadences. Yeah, Finally. Now, you did say that, didn't you, Chris? I did. In the video the other week. But it's controversial because a lot of people do feel a benefit from it. But it might well be that actually the benefit you're feeling is coincidental as a result of maybe doing more structured training or perhaps doing less of another type of training that's maybe over fatiguing you. Uh, but you've got to say as well that if you do feel like a training session is beneficial, the psychological effect of doing stuff that you think works is huge as well. And gains are gains, aren't they? So, you know. Well, they were until they watched this show and realised there was no point doing it. That That is actually valid, yeah. So. You could have carried on doing what you're doing, but now you can't. So that's the end of low cadence work. Ugh. I'm going to keep doing it. I'm not. Right then, Si, on to some cycle race news now. Organisers of some of the largest bike races in the world, not least the Tour de France, have announced that they're pulling two of the highest profile women's world tour races from the calendar. This is because they're not going to provide the requirement from the UCI, which is live TV coverage. Yeah. That's not cool, is it? Yolanda Neff, I think, uh, former cross-country world man's bike champion, Perhaps put it best uh, when she took to Twitter, saying, Dear fossil grandpas in power, making decisions is like farting. When you press too hard, the result will probably be shit. Now, I'm not entirely sure whether that is a tweet against the ASO or the UCI or a bit of both, but either way, she makes a good point, doesn't she? I mean, yeah. it's not a great situation. There's no suggestion that they're actually going to pull the races from the calendar altogether, it's just they won't be in the Women's World Tour. So maybe the teams are going to have to boycott them, despite the fact they're so high profile. That's a bit yeah. of a mess, isn't it? And then they could go and support other events, I guess. Organisers of the Tour Norway, the Vargada West Sweden and the Danish Cycling Union have gotten together to collaborate and create a 10-day Battle of the North which sounds absolutely fantastic. If it does come off, it's going to be the longest event on the calendar. Although, unfortunately, we are going to have to wait a little bit longer. 2021 is when they're hoping to launch that. Battle of the North. I'm going to not say anything about Game of Thrones now, but still. What happened this week? I don't know. I haven't watched it yet. Uh, right, now, uh, sorry, you got me thinking about Game of Thrones. I'm <laughs> uh, going to have to do this next bit quietly so yeah. that GMBN don't hear, because... Strictly speaking, we're not allowed to talk about drop handlebars. No, we're not. We're not allowed to talk about flat handlebars and knobbly tyres at the same time, no. are we? Contractually, we can do one or the other. Yeah, that's right. So knobblies and drop handlebars or flat handlebars and slicks. But anyway, it's relevant to us because Matthew van der Poel has just qualified for the Tokyo Olympics, having come second at the opening round of the Mountain Bike World Cup at the weekend and having won the short track that opens proceedings on the Friday now. So he pretty much nailed it, didn't he, really? He did, yeah. He now goes on to lead the World Cup after Albstadt, Germany. Although, to be really honest, it was quite weird to see him not winning this year, wasn't it? Well, that's right. Not used to that anymore. I was expecting him to unleash some kind of Amstel gold finish yeah. there and take the win, but uh, but no, only second for yeah. Van der Poel. However, after the finish, he gave a glimpse into what he's planning for the future. And he said that big, or the Grand Tours are his, his next goal after the 2020 Olympics, citing actually the Tour de France because the Giro and the Fuelta are too hilly for him at this moment. Do you think he's going for GC? Do you think he's eyeing up GC at the Tour de France? I would see him more as a points jersey, really. He can do anything, Matthew yeah, van der Poel. He, so far he can, can't he? I'd love, to, I'd love to see him go for GC. Maybe it's not possible. Of course, all eyes are on Italy this month. It's been a big week of build-up at the Giro as the GC specialists all wait their big tests. Yeah, they did have one, finally, on Sunday with that second time trial. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Primoz Roglic came out on top, but 
he was pushed pretty hard by Victor Campanas, yeah. who perhaps would have taken the win were it not for this bike change. This horrible, horrible bike change. Worst of all time, especially considering it looked like it had been planned as well. Well, you'd think, wouldn't you, given that he swapped from a TT bike onto a road bike. Yeah. Anyway. No, it's too early to draw any conclusions from this year's Giro, isn't it? But one thing is for sure. Roglic looks like he is in scintillating form. He does, but Nibali also looks like he's yeah. going better than he's gone in a long time. Simon Yates, not so much now, having hemorrhaged three minutes to Roglic yeah. on that time trial. But Hank has been catching up with his direct support team, Matt White. Thanks, guys. We're at the Giro d'Italia, and I'm joined with uh, Matt White from Michelin Scott, the direct support team of Michelin Scott. How is it going for the for you? I mean, last year Yatesy was in pink and he went off quite hard. What's the change of tactics going into this year's race? Well, the last 24 hours is probably going to change our tactics again. Uh, look, we came into the race very much course dependent. Uh, it's been a very uneventful first half of the year because of the course design. There's been we haven't done any major climbs yet, uh, which is pretty unheard of for this going this far deep into the race. So obviously we're going to sit back. The two time trials we're going to define this first period. Had a great prologue with Simon and uh, a prologue that we'd rather forget yeah. yesterday. But uh, look, it is what it is. Uh, but we have to adjust our plans for what is always a very, very tail end heavy to the heavy end of the race, and that that kicks off on Thursday. Yeah, I, I've been up a few of the big climbs. There's a lot of snow on top. How's uh, Yatesy feeling? Is he feeling good? Is he excited about going into the mountains? He is. He is. Uh, yeah. He, he really wants to rip it apart yeah. and uh, we've got a really good team here and so nothing's going to change, it's just that we're going to be coming from a little bit further back than we would have liked. Yeah. But there's a few teams in the same situation so I would expect uh, starting this week to be a very, very aggressive uh, period because at the moment you see Rodgelik and, and Nibali are sort of up here yeah. and then everybody else is, is, needs time uh, and I think that uh, teams like Astana, teams like Movistar, teams like us, we're going to put those guys under a lot of pressure this weekend. Interesting, very interesting. Uh, right, now you'll know by now that we have two more GCN events coming this summer. One in Avoriaz in France and a second in Saalbach in Austria. We have had one or two people contacting us to say that they're a little bit concerned that maybe they're not good enough or experienced enough to come out and ride with us. So we just want to stress here and now that these events are very much catering to all ability. So anyone can come out and ride with us and you shouldn't be worried in the slightest. No, there'll be sessions to help you improve your skill and confidence on the bike, plus also help you to learn to ride safely in a group. Yep, yeah, and also group rides for all abilities yes. as well. So if you're feeling fast and frisky, there'll be a ride for you. Frisky on the bike, let me stress. Uh, and if you're, if you're new to the sport, then there'll be slower rides as well. So please do not be daunted by this. And actually also important to note that if you're coming out with, with a partner or a friend that doesn't ride, there are non-rider packages available. So make sure you head over to the event website, gcnevents.co, all the information is on there. It's now time for hack forward slash bodge. And first up, we have Evan on his 2012 Ridley Noah. And look at that. That is a broom handle holding a GoPro so that he could film his favorite climb, Lee Hill. I mean, I guess it would work. It's an interesting camera angle, that one, isn't it? But yeah, I... instead of a drone, maybe? Is that the Zwift camera angle? Is that, what, is that what they call it? I think, Evan, you're gonna to need to send us the footage for us to actually judge whether this is an inspirational piece of Ooh, cinematography or a total, total bodge. So the jury is out on Evan's GoPro mount on a stick. What would the footage look like when you get out of the saddle? That's what I want to know. You just look, Evan, let us know. Uh, right, next up, we have this intriguing looking fairing on the front of a pair of aero bars, uh, sent in by Jolly um, from Norfolkshire land. Uh, his words, not mine. Um, anyway, he said uh, it's the UCI Ugly Carbon Initiative Award. Uh, he banned it himself uh, after one ride. Anyway, <laughs> there we go. He said he found it in the back of his carbon cave and decided to share it. Only five hours work and 16 hours to bake for one one hour ride. At least you didn't waste your time. Well, I'm glad you censored it, because, uh, I mean, I, d I can't see that that would ever be a, a need for that, no. would it? Doesn't if look it's really a real aerodynamic cold either. I don't know. Right. Hand warmer, yes, there yeah. you go, Chris, you've nailed it. It might not be a complete waste of time. Just put some kind of like heating elements in it and then you've got toasty hands. Next up, we've got time. two from Jay. I'm gonna move you on from there. Sorry. We've got two from Jay now from uh, Norcal. One of many hacks and bodges, apparently. First up, he's got a light 
that's attached to a cork, which has been screwed to his Wahoo mount somehow. I like that. It's clever. You I'm not going to lie, yeah. I mean, part of me worries that it might just fall off because corks are not renowned for their kind of structural integrity. And that looks like a half decent light, but centrally mounted lights. Very good. Regular viewers will know that's a, a big thing for me. Yep. Um, this next one is utterly terrifying. Yeah, uh, it's gone downhill very quickly. Yeah, he's fixed a tub with an industrial sewing machine and chew goo. Fortunately, he's still underneath. It's worked, but he didn't press his luck. I think you're pushing so. your luck just by having that on your bike. Yeah. I don't, it doesn't matter if you're riding or not. Look at the state of it. Look how beautiful those wheels are. I used to love those wheels. And you've, you've got that on it. Yeah. Anyway, there we go. At least, at least you have also removed that product from your bike. Yes. Uh, next up, this. I think this is going to be a hack, isn't it? Well, yeah. again, we have to hide this from GMBN because it's knobbly tires and flat handlebars. The, the wheels aren't in the bike, so it's okay. Ah, uh, yeah, technicality. Um, but yeah, look at that. A, uh, a, a rack mount for your scooter. Now, I really like this because I really want to have a motorbike for my commute. And I think this is genius. This is the best way to carry a bike. Well, there we go then. Mark from Malta, uh, you got yourself a hack with that. Quite intrigued to know how you've done it. So, uh, so there we go. Uh, anyway, one last point. Um, yeah. So Kurt Edmonds got in touch on Instagram to say that he knew what those ridiculously tiny looking inner tubes were that were featured in a hack from last week. Apparently they're Tubalito tubes. Never heard of them before, but they weigh like 30 grams or something. So how much is a normal tube? Like 120. Oh wow, that's, that's impressive. Oh, bonkers. Just take a look at them, look at that. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. See? There we go. Anyway, if you'd like to get involved in uh, hack or bodge next week, then simply send in a picture or a video of your hack forward slash bodge, uh, either on the uploader or using the hashtag GCN hack. And remember, uh, Evan, as well, to get that footage in from your aerial GoPro. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that. It is now caption competition. So that point in the show where we give you a photo, you let us know your caption underneath in the comments section and we pick out a winner. The winner getting a Camelback water bottle and the winner of last week is... It is the real Grand Cyclismo. And the caption is, oh, you finally got a tattoo. Yeah, it was about time. That's great. That's that is absolutely me. great. Love it. There we go. So get in touch and we will send you your GCN Camelback water bottle. Uh, the photo this week, Primoz Roglic doing his old ski jumpy thing. Can I, can I have a go at this one? Yes, please. In Lordy's absence. <clears throat> Primoz Roglic more confident than me in his antiperspirant. That seems fair, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's accurate. It's absolutely accurate. You couldn't pay me enough money for me to raise my arms at this point in the GCN show. So. No, well, I mean, I'm not as embarrassed, but yeah, it's quite warm in here. <laughs> right, there we go. Anyway, if you think you can beat that one, and I suggest you probably can, then stick your caption in the comment section down below and we will pick, as I said, a winner next week. Before we get on to what is coming up on the channel for this week, it's that time where we take a look back through some of the amazing comments that you've been leaving in, uh, under videos from the last seven days. I'm gonna get things started with Ollie's great video where he talked to Nigel Mitchell, Team EF Education first, basically finding out exactly what pro cyclists eat during a Grand Tour. Uh, hey Treacle, said, uh, why isn't the bloody answer one large bar of chocolate, two glasses of red wine and a pork pie? That would be good, wouldn't nice, it? Wouldn't it? Uh, and then Savage Poet said, a bike nutritionist who eats his own name, Nigels. Wow. That's good. I Mind like that blown. One. Then on the video that Hank and I did, How Not To Be A Dick, why would I be a duck on a bike? That's a good point, that. Try shake tops. Yep. Oh, and I definitely, oh, this is from Ulysses. I definitely acknowledge other cyclists. I draw the line though, at acknowledging triathletes. <laughs> Presumably that's just people that don't wear socks. Or any clothes, most of the time. Yeah, it's a good point, actually. Although, if we're abandoning all the rules. Wave to everyone now. That's it, yeah. Uh, right, uh, under, it, I'm thinking he was joking, by the way, just oh, before right. people get across here. Yeah. That was a joke. Uh, right, under uh, how to sprint like Elia Viviani, Greg Loper said, uh, GCN could have had last, he introduced a video of paint drying, and the top comments would have been the same. Good to see you, Tom. Uh, yeah, a rare screen appearance from Lasty these days, but uh, much appreciated. It was good. Audience. Yeah. And then we got a harsh but fair one from Michael McDermott on last week's show. Incredible commitment from James to go pink for the Giro. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Poor old James. Uh, right then, what is coming up on the channel this week? Chris Stang on Wednesday. Coming up on Wednesday is How to Train with Power. On Thursday, we then have The Italian Job, which is an amazing collaboration with James, Ollie, and Alan over in Italy. And you have to see it, it's, it is really, really good. They got cold for that one. They so did get very cold it, yeah. many times. Then on Friday, we've got Ask Do You See Anything back here in the set. On yeah. Saturday. Saturday is how to use Kamut. So we talk about it quite a lot in videos, but many of you might not know about it. So uh, it's a navigation app that we use, so we thought we would explain everything. Uh, and then Sunday, just how hard is the hardest Grand Tour stage of the year? Ollie and James went to find out. And uh, once again, they suffered. Yeah, judging by the stories, that's one not to miss as well. Yeah, the food poisoning that they got actually isn't part of a Grand Tour normally. Oh, right. That was an extra they chose to do. It was an added extra. I yeah. bet it is part of a Grand Tour for many riders. Yeah, well, in it the is, past, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, right, and then of course, Monday and Tuesday is a GCN Racing News Show and the GCN Show. Not forgetting all the other amazing content that's coming back from the Giro d'Italia. So stay tuned to that here. And then also on the Tech Channel, not to mention on Facebook, where we have our wrap up show every day. So, uh, so stay tuned. Busy, busy. We are getting towards the end of the show now, but thank you very much for watching. Yeah, a quick heads up before we go though, we have now launched a new version of our GCM fan kit available in blue, black and green. And I think it looks particularly stunning. It does, it looks very cool. That's up for pre-order now. Uh, make sure you do head over to the GCM shop where of course we have all sorts of limited edition bits and bobs like these rather jazzy t-shirts. Uh, anyway, like I said, thank you very much for watching. Uh, if you want to check out a cracking video where we managed to get some quality behind the scenes access to Vincenzo Nibali's ride at the opening time trial at the Giro d'Italia. You can click through on screen now.